Hello, this is Dino Patijalal. Welcome to Foreign Policy Tapes. This is an FPCCI program to get insights and stories and analysis from foreign policy practitioners. And today we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, one of Southeast Asia's uh, top diplomats. Uh, um, uh, this is uh, our friend Ambassador Delia Domingo Albert, who is the first woman career diplomat to become Secretary of Foreign Affairs uh, in, in, in Asia. Everybody knows uh, Ambassador Delia. Uh, she is a, a steady hand a diplomat, a very much a, a seasoned uh, a diplomat who has been around for uh, and witnessed the, the birth and the growth of ASEAN. And that is what we're going to talk uh, about uh, today. Uh, but a little bit more about Ambassador Delia. She was also chair of the UN Security Council in 2000 where she introduced the agenda, the role of civil, civil society in post-conflict uh, peace building. Uh, she studied uh, at the University of Philippines, uh, the Institute of International Studies in Geneva, uh, the Diplomatic Institute in Salzburg, Boston University uh, overseas uh, in Bonn, and then JFK School of Government at Harvard University. That is uh, extremely I was uh, always studying, Dino. Oh my God, I am envious. Uh, you are a true uh, academic, right? Not really, I uh, just have fun. Ah, uh, good. So, uh, Ambassador Delia, uh, welcome to Jakarta. You're here to attend uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, meetings. I I'm just wondering if you can share us the story about uh, the birth of ASEAN. I was born in 1965. Oh, so, you were two years old. Exactly. And here I was working. <laughs> yes. So... T tell, tell us your recollection yeah, that you happened. Know, yeah. uh, I was lucky in a way after my foreign service course and on my, uh, uh, I had to wait to get old enough to take the foreign service exam. So I, I went to Japan as a student uh, leader, whatever you want to call it. And when I was old enough, I went back and uh, I met the foreign minister whom I introduced in three languages in a university event. And since then he said, I want a secretary who speaks different languages. So I advise everyone who wants to join the Foreign Service to learn foreign languages. Could what we... were the three languages? At that time, I had, uh, of course, English. I had uh, French. And I had Japanese. And, of course, Filipino. But uh, I introduced him in those languages. And he was, it was the first time he was ever introduced in foreign languages. So... That must have made a uh, uh, an impression. And I always tell our young people, you know, sometimes you have to be in the right place, the right time, with the right people, but with the right credentials. You must have those credentials, otherwise the other three won't work. So I got there and uh, that was, I entered the Foreign Service in February 67 as the secretary to the foreign minister. And the first thing I was asked to do was to get everything ready because they were planning something big in Bangkok. There was a lot of telephone calls. There were no computers. Remember, 67, we had to type the, the good old uh, typewriter uh, and the fax machine and the telex machine. That's how we worked. You kids are very lucky today. You can just even use your watch to do all your messaging. But in those days, you needed a telephone. You needed all these things. So I had the privilege to make telephone calls to the foreign ministers who were consulting each other. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most memorable telephone call was between Ramos and Adam Malik. And each time they would talk, I said, hello, brother. You know, looking back, I don't hear that anymore among our leaders. I don't know. Perhaps I'm not there anymore anyway. So there was a very good uh, sort of a personal contact between and among them. And I think this is what created so much trust between and among these uh, leaders in ASEAN that they had no qualms about getting together initiative of uh, uh, Tanat Koman at that time. As you may know, uh, we tried to do some regional meetings. You had Association of Southeast Asia, 
with the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand put together, but there were bilateral issues, and so it collapsed between the Philippines and Malaysia at the time. Then we had Mafilindo. Philippines felt very strongly that Indonesia should be in this conversation. So President Lakapagal then invited Indonesia, so you had Mafilindo, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. Again, that did not uh, prosper because there were bilateral issues. And this is where Tanat Koman came in and said, the foreign minister, foreign of minister of Thailand, Thailand. Yeah. and he said, "Let's all get together, the four of us." At the time, uh, Singapore was just independent. It's sixty-five. Is that your birth year? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, nineteen sixty-seven, they were invited by Tanat Koman. So you had the famous picture of the five foreign ministers sitting and signing the ASEAN Declaration. But I have to tell you that before. They did that. There was a lot of talk about their golf game, which was very important in those days. So they said, okay, before we go and sign, let's play a round of golf at Bang Sayan. That was a military golf course outside of the, the city. And that's where they ironed out the kinks, so to speak. So when they got back to the foreign ministry in Thailand, we, they were ready with, a, with a for, the, the, the document. And of course, it got through all the senior officials. But what was important was the way that the four, these five leaders came together with very clear thinking that this was something good for everyone. Interestingly, if you look at the uh, Bangkok, declaration. First, in the list of aims and purposes, talking about economic benefit of the people of the region. Number two was peace and security. I'm not sure if that was really the intent that put one over the other, but it was clear that their mindset was looking, how do we get our people in the region to get a better life? Uh, of course, uh, peace and security was just as important. But what struck me in the charter, in the Bangkok uh, Declaration, was economic uh, prosperity and for the benefit of the people of ASEAN. I think that was foremost in their minds. But there were, of course, uh, related issues at the time. Uh, Thailand was facing the spread of communism in the region. And, and that was also a political uh, situation reigning at that time. If you look back, I think there was so much pragmatism in the way our leaders were thinking, more pragmatic than perhaps ideological. And I think if you look back and looking at the ABAC meeting that happened, I think this is what they meant. You see all these people working together to bring the economy together lift the uh, life standards of the people in the region. So I was, I was quite impressed and I must congratulate Indonesia for, for doing a very good uh, meeting of the private sector because I strongly believe that it is what is the glue that made ASEAN really become a, a world uh, convening power, so to speak, if you look, talk about centrality. Yeah. Yeah. We have attracted people mm -hmm. to come to us. But what's important, I think, for ASEAN now, 56, is to be more assertive of what we need as a region. We don't have to be aggressive. We, we, we can be assertive. We have gained a certain posture in the international scene, respected by all our 11 dialogue partners. I used to say 10, but now UK is it. Sectoral partners. Uh, organizations around the world are partners, uh, Shanghai uh, Group, uh, GCC, they all come to ASEAN. And, and to me, this is, this is great. Yes. Uh, what an evolution. Yeah. Yes. Uh, tell us, back then, the Philippines was a treaty ally of the U.S. Uh, still is, yeah. Uh, and then... And Thailand was also, yeah. Yes, Sito. Yes. Uh, but then this idea about 
this strange new animal, ASEAN, you know. Uh, why was your foreign minister, foreign minister Ramos, persuaded that this was a good idea, uh, given the circumstances uh, at the time? Because, you know, it was just a new concept, possibly strange concept, because it was it would be encompassing five countries with different interests and uh, you know different uh, political systems and and, and so on. But what? Why do you think Foreign Minister Ramos was persuaded? You know, it's uh, this was the same question posed by Rod Severino, mm. and I said, you know, Rod, at that time we were all newly liberated in terms of uh, pe- countries gaining their independence, uh, Malaysia, and of course Singapore separating. Mm. Uh, the Philippines, of course, was in those days, doing quite well. Right. and But still, there was also a threat somewhere that they m- must have felt that if we don't work together, we may fall one by one. And therefore, if we don't put our act together, get together like-minded leaders who are thinking now, of a better future after liberating ourselves uh, from all the baggage of the past. This was what must have, and then he felt, he felt good talking to these men who he felt had the same idea of getting together and getting our act together so that we become a bigger whole and not just separate entities. Of course, we all had our bilateral meetings. As you said, we had our bilaterals very strongly with the U.S. And uh, sometimes it, we were not quite happily seen because of this. And the same, ta- same thing with uh, Thailand uh, being treaty uh, members of uh, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. But the comfort zone that we must he must have felt to be talking in the same wavelength as Adam Mali, uh, Raja Ratnam, uh, and uh, Tun Abdul Razak, was gelled together by Tanat Koman when he invited them to get together. And I always like to say that the glue was golf. You know, mm. They also talked about golf. And, and as you know, how, how golf was important. I don't know if it still is today. Where, where we call it Documentation Day, and that's where the uh, leaders uh, address issues of, uh, of great importance, but at the same time feeling comfort, comfortable with each other and trusting each other. To me, that was very important. And I think yeah. Ramos felt that he could trust this wonderful guy that he was working with. Yeah, and by the way, if on on golf, did they actually talk substance like policy issues, or it was more non-policy uh, uh, conversations? Yeah, uh, were they doing both uh, during? Oh yes, oh golf? yes, yes. Yeah. I, I I remember uh, one time when uh, when AFTA was being discussed in in Singapore in 1992, there were so many contentious issues. You know, of course, Bali uh, was promoting CEPT uh, mm-hmm. rather than in AFTA and uh, other uh, Singapore and Thailand, we were looking at it uh, with open eyes. And it was important to try to talk to each other away from the table so they can even be more free in the way they think about it without causing any ruffles to be, any feathers to be ruffled. And I, I think uh, I remember, of course, we, we always looked at Indonesia and said, oh, what will Indonesia think about AFTA? You know? And there were many closed door meetings. And in fact, uh, when we were watching, we were the bystanders. We had done our job as uh, DGs of ASEAN. We were working with SEOM, we were working with SOM leaders. Uh, but we had the access to the foreign ministers because we, we DGs had that uh, direct contact. And one 
of those times. I said, I wonder what Indonesia will think when Anan Panyaracun will come and, and, and Singapore, of course. Uh, we watched the body language when uh, we were watching Pa Ali and we were guessing. If Pa Ali comes out with a closed jacket, it's no. <laughs> if he comes in an open jacket, it's yes. You know how he used to wear this double-breasted yeah, yeah. suit, yeah. very elegant. Yeah, he comes opening his jacket. So, yes, you see how it was, how simple things were yeah. then. You know, but of course, a lot of work has been put into it, a lot of give and take, and that's how ASEAN does it. You, you give a little, take a little, and then you you move on. But thinking always of the collective good. I always think of the greater good for the greater number could be a guiding light for many of these issues that seem to uh, get into the agenda of ASEAN. Yeah. Uh, do you, would you agree that the four ministers that, that signed the ASEAN declaration uh, they, they turned out to be statesmen, right? Because uh, the, the, the leaders were not involved in ASEAN. No. So Harto in 67 was like, hey, you do the own thing, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. There was so much uh, responsibility on the foreign ministers in those days, mm -hmm. you know, because the presidents or the prime ministers have more or less national issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. And foreign relations went to the foreign ministers. I think this was the situation. We had national issues that the president had to look after. The same with, with Indonesia, the same with uh, Malaysia and, and Thailand. So there was so much uh, contact on foreign policy and responsibility that was given to the foreign ministers. Uh, today, I think uh, top diplomats would be the presidents or the prime ministers. It has been elevated to that point. But in those days, because of the urgency of national issues, you're right. The responsibility in foreign policy went to the foreign ministry. Yeah. And also, and now there's secretariat. Back then, there was no secretariat. That's now there's a rotational chairmanship. Back then, there was no such thing, right? Uh, and, you know, I think these days people think Indonesia is... Uh, has some kind of a leadership role within within ASEAN. Yes. But back then, among the five, there was no one that is assumed to be a natural leader. No, yes. they were all mm -hmm. together. When when the decision came to... Uh, to me, it was a recognition of the leadership role of Indonesia. Back then? In, back then, yeah. uh, in, in those days, mm -hmm. you know. You had uh, leadership in uh, the Bandung, uh, the non-alignment, mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot of respect for that. Mm -hmm. And you, you were the big boy, you mm -hmm. know, and there was a lot of respect. And of course, uh, Indonesia was generous to, to, to offer, you know, it was a nice gesture for, for, for the leader mm -hmm. to, to host this. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look back today, uh, I... It was a pity that we couldn't finish that talk yesterday, but I was looking at how the Secretariat is, and I think we have to really do some thinking about it now that we have grown this big, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember Kissinger's comment on the EU, mm -hmm. who do I call when there's a problem? Mm -hmm. Which number do I call? Mm -hmm. In ASEAN today, do you call the Secretariat, Secretary General of ASEAN? It was during our time that we changed his title from uh, Secretary General of the Secretariat. And we decided we should give him more leeway and we made him Secretary General of ASEAN mm -hmm. and gave him a ministerial rank. That was during our time. Mm -hmm. Because we felt as, as DGs that he should have more responsibility and clout at the same time. Mm -hmm. But today, you have all this... Uh, the three pillars. Who do you call? The chairman of the three pillars. Mm -hmm. Then you have the uh, perm reps. Then you have the national secretariats. I think with the 
high-level talks ongoing, it should be a very serious consideration how the Secretariat could be more responsive in today's needs of ASEAN. After all, it's, uh, to me, it's about time. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it reform, perhaps restructure, but looking at it, it served its purpose in the beginning. But if you look at ASEAN's posture today in the world, there has to be some thinking about that. And, and I asked somebody yesterday, and somebody asked me too during lunch, and I said, when there's an issue, who do you call? Do you call the Secretary General, the rotating chairman, the chairman of one of the three pillars? Uh, so that's one thing I was looking at the, yesterday as, as I look back to the experience we've had in the past uh, 56 years. Yes. Well, ASEAN is looking into the next 20 years. Uh, ASEAN, uh, the Concord for uh, what would happen after 2025 and towards 2045. I wonder what you think um, after ASEAN's long history, what should be in that vision of uh, the next 20 years for ASEAN? You know, uh, after talking about Secretariat, I always look at surveys. You know, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies has a wonderful annual survey. The Philippines has a survey on how well the people know what ASEAN is about. Mm. And it's also, it's always a sad story that after all these years, ASEAN has more or less stayed with the leaders who attend meetings, the uh, bureaucrats, uh, the journalists who cover the reports, uh, the, the business sector. I think for ASEAN to fo follow the thinking of my former foreign minister to survive, the people of ASEAN has to be better engaged. Mm. I'm, I'm sure its country would have its own way to do it. But I w I'm hoping that the new high-level visioning for the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years would put uh, more emphasis or even uh, look at how ASEAN could be in the minds of the people because for any or organization to survive, the people whom they're supposed to be serving should know what it is about. And there has to be a kind of downstreaming, cascading, not only top down, but down up in terms of how people would like to see the organization to, to serve them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is the mindset to me that is most challenging for ASEAN today. Uh, I am always uh, shy about statistics when I look at our own survey, you know, in the Philippines. So I said, how do we reach out? And this was high on the mind of President Ramos because he was a convinced ASEAN person. Mm -hmm. And one day, Fidel Ramos, Fidel Ramos yes. the son of my former boss, oh. Narcisa Ramos. Mm -hmm. The father and son were really, really mm -hmm. uh, convinced about ASEAN. And we were looking at the uh, survey uh, just before the 250th anniversary. And we were talking because they asked him to talk, they asked me to talk. So I said, what, can, what is our message? And he said, you know, the people should know about what we're doing, what ASEAN is all about. And he said, you are a member of Asia Society. Why don't you do that for the Philippines? You, you have your own ASEAN Society. He was the one who gave the name. ASEAN Society, Let, it's a people-driven way to look at ASEAN. Has it served them well? How do they support it? That kind of thinking. You know, people like them had such forward-looking. Uh, so I said, okay, okay. I said, but you're chairman emeritus or whatever. And he said, yeah, I'll be chairman, but you do the job. <laughs> that's, that's leadership. Yes. They know who to delegate the job. But 
I I think that this is one way, and uh, I'm sure every country would have its own way. But in 2019, so we got organized in 2016 before the 50th anniversary. And when I was invited for some meetings for the 50, for the 2019 meeting, I think, in Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, Don Pramidwinai, who was the deputy prime minister and foreign minister, I said, you know, Don, in one of our meetings before we talked about engaging the people of ASEAN, I said, I have this ASEAN society. You have your ASEAN association. Your chair, why don't you call a ASEAN-wide meeting to get people sensitized that you need the people behind ASEAN? Yeah, he did it. You see, I think this is a follow-through, what I'm talking about, that is trust when you know each other. And he did. We convened the first one in 2019. But, of course, 2020 came, the pandemic sort of, interrupted uh, what was initiated and I thought could be revived and, and uh, everybody participated in that, although it was done hurriedly because uh, that was December 2019. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how each one will exchange ideas on how to reach out to the people and how ASEAN could reach out and how people themselves could reach out to ASEAN. And, and, and I, I think it's something that can be done. Yeah. And if you look at the future of ASEAN, if we want it to survive, mm -hmm. quote unquote, mm -hmm. we, we have to engage. Absolutely. Uh, and I think you're doing that here. So uh, yes. perhaps I'll copy you. <laughs> yes. They say the best compliment is to be copied. Uh, Ambassador Dilia, I have a final question for you. At FPCI, we always talk about trust and how trust is really a important recipe in developing relations between nations. And it also determines a uh, condition of uh, regional stability and cooperation. And in the early years of uh, ASEAN, when it came to birth, I mean, trust was uh, certainly uh, a challenge because Indonesia and Malaysia had confrontasi and Indonesia and Singapore, Malaysia and <laughs> Philippines also. You know, there were these issues that made it hard for trust to develop. I'm just wondering how in those early years uh, they were able to overcome that and, and develop uh, this very rare and precious thing called uh, strategic trust or political trust between them. Yeah, I, I, I think it wasn't easy for, for everyone because, mm -hmm. as you know, there were bilateral issues. And by the way, my first uh, really diplomatic assignment was to organize a meeting between Tuna Blue Razak mm -hmm. and Narcisa Ramos. Narcisa Ramos told me, I want to get to know Tunreza better. Mm. I have visited in Malaysia. There's a beautiful place in the Genting Highlands and, and all this. And he said, you come from Baguio. You, it, very much like Genting Highlands. I'd like to invite him up there. We have quiet time, the most important, we're going to play golf. Mm -hmm. That was my first challenge to organize in mm -hmm. my diplomatic career. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I'm from that town, Baguio, it's uh, up in the north, 1,800 meters above sea level, mm -hmm. about uh, the whole, uh, the forest and everything like Genting Highlands. We brought uh, Tunrazak and his wife there and uh, Ramos and his wife, and there was nervous uh, what will happen, and I hope this thing with uh, Saba uh, will be discussed. And and uh, both had to know each other personally, mm -hmm. one by one, each one sort of. Uh, and and to me, the, the most crucial meeting was between 
Narcisa Ramos and Tundraza. Mm -hmm. Because this is what was holding back the Philippines, uh, Malaysia. And, you know, it was not an easy situation. It was uh, over Samba. And they came down from the talks, happy and, and saying, we should continue this dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, some things happened before that. Uh, President uh, Marcos had this uh, idea of going there and uh, uh, the Malaysians did like it. And so we had cut diplomatic rights temporarily. I mean, that was serious, you know. But there was already this personal uh, contact between the two that they could talk to each other, they could be frank with each other. And remember, at that time, foreign policy was in their hands. Mm -hmm. So they felt they were empowered, more or less, to take responsibility over what they're doing in terms of the foreign policy of the country. Uh, that is a limited example of how the two built in this trust between them. Mm. That whatever happened afterwards, they were still in touch with each other, they were talking to each other. Uh, in So far as Indonesia and Malaysia, I think there was also the possibility for them again to be frank with each other, to talk to each other. But I can only talk about what I saw from my experience how this trust was de being developed between these two leaders. Uh, in a way, I think this has uh, been a common feeling when the four, f first the four and then the five met. And I think the constant, I uh, have somebody documented it. There were 72 bilateral meetings before ASEAN declaration was born. I'm not so sure. I have to validate that. But this uh, a friend of mine, a professor at the University of the Philippines, she was documenting who was talking to whom, who were uh, contacting whom, and I was feeding her the information. Uh, mm. Who did uh, Ramos talk to? And I said, uh, people sometimes say that ASEAN have too many meetings, but there is value in getting to, to, to know you, although I knew your father before you I knew mm -hmm. you. And there is this kind, and, and I think in the, I'm not talking about Asian way, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of, we're kind to each other, mm -hmm. we're polite to each mm -hmm. other. And I think a lot of those elements uh, sort of were in the nature of these wonderful men who were thinking not just for their national good, but looking at the region, there was really concern what was going to happen to them. That was also the challenge from outside. And something like, hey, we better get together or else. And there was that pressure. Uh, and this pressure was felt more by Thailand, and we all had our issues, all had our national issues, security issues. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we were able to share uh, our concerns, and, and this uh, access to being able to talk to each other created so much in my mind how individuals can learn to trust each other by having this really contact with each other. Uh, I hope that this uh, kind of uh, feeling is uh, continued because this is this is what keeps us together. Yeah, and just following that, does that make you concerned today that around the world uh, we see that space for dialogue is uh, really uh, uh, shrinking? Uh, because the ASEAN experience, as you said, is. Uh, we change the region by people, by leaders talking to one another, right? And overcoming their differences and, and managing the way forward. But now you, you see this geopolitical rivalries, you know, US, China and, and, and so on. Uh, 
where uh, uh, people are connecting less, leaders are connecting less, and and not having an exchange of views that are similar to what we you had uh, in 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 ASEAN. Is, is does that concern? Yeah. Well, to me, with everything's growing, so populations are growing, uh, governments are expanding, but we should never lose sight that people of ASEAN should be engaged themselves. Mm. To me, this is key to keeping that feeling that we belong to a region together it has to be better uh, shared with a greater number of students, of uh, professions. Of I, I think it's being done. I, I see it in the meetings of the uh, third uh, pillar. Mm -hmm. But to me, what I see is that all these things does not cascade into this consciousness that we are not alone in this world, that we, we, we are people out there in Jakarta, in, in, in Manila, and, and these are real people like us who dream about the same things, who mm. aspire for the same things. And I think if this is better mm. uh, uh, delivered in terms of uh, the general public, it will strengthen also the leaders' minds to say, oh, the people think this is good for us. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there are some who are more responsive, perhaps less responsive. But there are uh, groups. And, and when I thought of my ASEAN society, uh, people said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll try to reach out as much as I can and, and see how it grows. And and perhaps uh, anything that would make the people feel that this is something that is something in it for them, then perhaps they could accept it more. And to me, the strength of ASEAN will be in the way the people will behave to be towards each other. So I I, I feel that the uh, the connectivity map, the uh, action plan for connectivity. Mm -hmm should be taken more seriously mm. in terms of not just institutional connectivity, but the people's people connectivity. Mm. Uh, I, I've, I've seen this in, uh, do you remember the early days when they had this, uh, uh, the J J Japan had this ship of friendship or mm. something? Mm. Yeah. I've been meeting people who were there and, and they're friends for life. Mm. Yes, that's true. You know? That's true. We're in this together. Yeah. And and to have that feeling that we're in this together and, and not just what's good for Indonesia, what's good for the Philippines, but we are one in, in a way. It's it's easy. People say, oh, you're so diverse. I said, yes, but we, we have one thing in mind. We, we want to live together in peace so we can move on. Mm -hmm. And this has allowed ASEAN to be what it is today. Uh, I, I think this has to be carried on, and I'm looking at your wonderful magazines, and if you can share that with the rest of ASEAN, I think it would be good, you know, yeah. to get to know you better and to get to understand why you behave the way you do. And because at the end of the day, we we share the same similar goals in life, and and this is what has to be brought to the consciousness that we we are. We're so much alike in one way, and that I, my first, uh, one of my first projects when I was DG of ASEAN, I said, how can I make the people in the Philippines think that they belong to a region? So I asked a company, Nestle. You know, they had these beautiful posters of uh, drinking Milo milk or something. Mm -hmm. So I said, can you do a map of ASEAN for me for all the schools in the Philippines? You can put Milo at the end, and mm -hmm. you, and and. and I brought this idea to President Ramos and gave him a sample. He said, this is good. I want this distributed in all the schools. Mm -hmm. But that was ASEAN 6. Yes, sir. I don't know if they did it for ASEAN 10. But to have a visual idea that, hey, you're living in this, in this wonderful community. And to me, the, I like maps. Yeah. Mm. 
uh, for other reasons as well, but I like maps. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a visual help to make us realize, oh, how close we are to each other. You know, Menado is what, one hour away from Davao or something. Uh, so I, I would like to think that the uh, action plan for the, what, for connectivity should be taken more seriously. Yes, sir. And, and if you look at the, to looking at the future of ASEAN, more exchanges, more dialogues, more uh, sharing of experiences, uh, more contacts. Uh, and that's why I was happy to see last night's party, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody was, uh, yeah. But the party has to cascade to, to the people in the first floor, second floor, third floor. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and I think you're doing a great job with this. And yeah. uh, if you can share that with others, I'm, I'm, I'm sure people in the region are waiting for this. And uh, we've been so used to listening to people from the other from the external. I look at the internal and the external, and we really should strengthen more the internal uh, mm -hmm. relations among us. Um, yeah. to the, the external, fine, of course. You know, we live in a wider world. But the internal relationships and us um, to be stronger, I think it will pass the test of time. Yes. Well, that's uh, been very enlightening and inspiring for us, um, Ambassador Delia. I want to uh, thank you from a younger generation uh, for your service <laughs> and contribution to the region and to ASEAN. And it's been very inspiring for us to to learn um, your work. And we hope that uh, that good work can be continued by the next you know, generation. Somebody sent me a text yesterday uh -huh. after we spoke and he said, Ambassador, I didn't think you were couldn't imagine you were there already in 1967. I said, why? Well, I was born in 1969, England, <laughs> and you were already sitting there. I said, listen, you guys, uh, I never grow old with ASEAN. I came into ASEAN in my life when everything was happening, and then I want to continue this. And, and I said, remember, I said, I'm 80. How old are you? He said, well, okay. I think about that and I said, you have a lot of time to think about it and do something about it. Mm -hmm. It was one of the guys who, who was in the audience yesterday. Yeah, yeah. He said, she has been in ASEAN since 67. <laughs> I said, yes. And I never stopped. Yes. Here I am. Yes. Well, that that's an inspiration to all of us. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dino. Yeah, okay. thank you. I remember you were already two years old and I was running around. <laughs> yes. So... Yeah. Good. But your father uh, had a wonderful contribution. I remember meeting him, I think, in Geneva or New York. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, he was an, an expert on, on know what to see. Love to see us, yeah. yeah. And that is very dear to our heart. Yes. As you know. Yes. Yes, thank you. And uh, Indonesia, we're both uh, maritime ASEAN. Yes. And yeah. So much that we can share. Mm -hmm. so, thank you very much. Thank you. And... Uh, Please visit us again, Ambassador Delia. Anytime. Yeah. And that's uh, all the time we have. Uh, thank you for watching Foreign Policy Tapes. See you next time.